Good afternoon, Daniel and everyone. Thank you, Daniel. For being... Okay, In the... I am late. And so everybody else abandoned shift. No, except for Dorina and except for Stephanie. Uh, hello, and except for Jenna. Sorry, hello. Okay, no, thank you. Sorry, I am late. Um, and one thing that I do that is so self-destructive in a way is, you know, we always start with the board sitting up here prominently on the screen. The board has a clock that prominently tells me exactly how irresponsible I'm being. And then that is recorded for posterity. We all got to love that. Um, good afternoon, Jorgelis. And good afternoon, Jenna, if I didn't say, and hello, Stephanie, if I did say, and good afternoon, Darina, which I will say, and good afternoon, Daniel, which I totally am saying right now, and Sam for not having a black box, hello, and Amirani for having a name that I can pronounce, and Nikaya, good morning, good morning. Okay, sorry I'm late, people, seriously. Um, I have a really good reason for other things in my life, but not for that. Um, all right, we are gonna get rolling. Um, oh, I know my reason is that my coffee never brewed. That's my reason. Um, okay, no, it's not. Um, all right, I want to still continue with, we have a small, I think some people did actually give, they were like, what? He's 180 seconds late. That is so completely out of character. He must be hit by a truck. We're leaving. That's what happened. Because um, um, there do seem to be people not here. Okay, all right. I want to get straight back to this business that we've been saying about waves. Um, I love wave motion. There is much more to be said about it. Some of which today, and here are more people. Well, please pardon me. Okay. Um, the conclusion from Tuesday afternoon was the equation that's right in the middle of the page, the V equals omega over K. Um, that in a way is the big conclusion from Thursday. Um, I want to you know, review that briefly or re-explore that briefly. I want to remind you that that V is the very same V that is uh, the square root of the constant of proportionality in the wave equation, the second order partial differential equation, which I will write again on the next page. Um, in fact, let me do that right now. Just remember what we're dealing with at this point in the course. What, oh, hello. Direct tap person, no problem, no problem, but hello. And I was late too, as a matter of fact, I confess. Um, for all time, what we're really talking about is this right here. Right, this is what we've spent a couple of days deriving. This second order partial differential equation describes, fully describes a wave pulse, any system or situation or set of dependent variables that satisfy this equation do constitute a physical wave pulse, whether they, or a one-dimensional wave pulse, whether they immediately look that way or not. And anything that ever looks like a wave pulse, anything that acts like a wave pulse that is a wave pulse, including like a wave at Yankee Stadium of human beings or whatever, must be describable by this math equation. Like it is a two-way street. So, um, and again, what this basically says is that harmonic oscillations are happening in space and in time at the same time, right? I mean, that's what this is saying. Um, it is saying that, uh, uh, that, if you were, that if you were to pick any single point in time or and space of a, a larger phenomenon that looked to you like a wave pulse. I mean, such as a ripple of water coming in at the beach um, toward you, or such as a, 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 um, a crest and trough on a piece of string that's like rippling toward you as your lab partner holds the other end of it. Anything, or, or such as, I might add, a sound wave 
coming in from my mouth to your ear. I mean, that doesn't look like anything, but anything that strikes you as, oh, that's a wave pulse, then what you're really saying is pick any point in time and space involved in that whole pulse or that whole phenomenon that you're investigating, pick any point. And at that point in time, that point in space is accelerating back toward the equilibrium axis at a rate, like it's accelerating back home, back toward flatness at a rate that is directly proportional to the extent to which that piece of the pulse is concave, is distorted, is bent, is deformed. The more, so right? So, so a wave pulse is a piece of medium that is perpetually being restored back to equilibrium at exactly, at a rate of acceleration that's exactly proportional to how distorted it is, how unflat it is, how bent it is, how bowl shaped it is at that point. Right. I mean, it's, it's it really makes sense once you really think about it. And that's what the math is really saying, that acceleration is directly proportional to concavity. So it's just like a mass on a spring has an acceleration back to the equilibrium position that is directly proportional to how far away from the equilibrium position it is. We're saying we're like blowing up that concept into a higher dimension of space and saying the rate at which you accelerate back to an equilibrium line is directly proportional to how bent, how much you are bent away from that line, how much you are distorted in shape from flatness. Like that's what this is saying. Um, the constant of proportionality, however, is what we're sort of probing a lot yesterday and today. The constant of proportionality. Well, the constant of proportionality squared is the rate at which that pulse propagates through the medium. Um, like along the, in this case, x-axis, as opposed to the y-axis. In fact, let me even say that too. What we're assuming in this whole construction here, what we're assuming the way, I mean, notice, I don't want to get this too complicated or too muddled, but notice t, time is the independent variable, yeah, that I can say. This all assumes, this all assumes that y is the dependent variable, a function of x and t, which are the two simultaneous independent variables, right? And it assumes this this way of writing assumes that y is the axis along which all the little little particles um are oscillating why is the oscillation axis and x is the propagation axis well certainly x is the equilibrium axis and this all assumes that that every little bit will go up down up down up down in its little neighborhood so this little bit over here goes up down up down and the little bit next to it goes up down up down and a little bit next to it goes up down up down and that all happens within their little neighborhoods along a y axis and the result is this ripple this pulse this crest and trough cycling thing that starts to propagate along the x axis so that's like the, you know that's the picture that we are that's how we're using the variables here and the rate at which the propagate. So the please remember. I mean, the thing that's well, no, okay. Don't don't remember anything. Actually, forget that I just asked you to remember something for a moment. Um, v is the speed <coughs> at which the ripple propagates through the medium along the x-axis. Every time I say the medium, by the way, what do I really mean by the medium? The medium is that vast collection of material particles that are necessarily oscillating all in their little neighborhoods in order to together make this big propagation, right? Like the pulse that propagates is immaterial. The wave pulse that travels along the x-axis is not a thing. I mean, that's the thing I was going to say a second ago to remember. So now that you forgot about my having said that, you can remember it. But the, right, exactly. Say, well, actually, wait, I'm agreeing with Sam. I'm agreeing with Sam just because I see the word, but I actually can't even see what she wrote, but I'm just like sure that she's saying, hold on a second. Um, but wait, someone's coming, but let me look at Sam's chat, but the actual particles are pro right. Okay. No, no, yeah. I had a feel, I don't know. I just had a feeling that she, yeah. 
Okay, so let me say this slower now again. In, in fact, in fact, hold on, let's take a breath here. I want to just write, I, I want to, I want to reinforce what Sam is saying in the chat, and I'm going to read it out loud. Hang on one second, please. Um, Okay. Uh, no problem. Thank you, direct chat private person. Thank you for coming. I'm going to be, I was late too. You have not missed, you've missed exactly this page. Um, you haven't missed it at all. Actually, we're all here together. Um, we're on divine time. Um, okay, right. What Sam's saying, the actual particles, oscillators, are not propagating along the x-axis, comma, right? question mark. That's what she's saying. And I really want to reinforce that. Again, I, I, don't, you know, I don't want to make too big of a deal out of any one person, but I'm going to say right here now, she's speaking for everyone. That could not be closer to the truth uh, and a more direct expression of the truth that I'm trying uh, uh, like, like, like to spaz around for three days. Like, right. In order, the whole magic and mystery it's not really a mystery, but the, the apparent mystery of a wave pulse, what I do to this moment think is miraculous and magical about a wave pulse, is a wave pulse is a thing that moves through space and time, but isn't a thing, right? That, that's what she's getting at right there, what Sam's saying. Like, in order, in order for me to send a wave pulse to you, for example, even a sound wave, right? For me to talk, to send sound from my mouth, to your ears, and again, just for a moment, just forget the whole internet, like interposition of that, that just makes this whole point even more complicated and more exciting, but we don't even need that. Like assume you're in the same room for, with me, right? If I send what we call a, a, a sound wave or a sound pulse from my mouth to your ears, what I, I cannot emphasize enough is what Sam's saying, and that is this. First of all, for that to happen at all, there do have to be a bunch of material particles sitting there ready to go between my mouth and your ears. There's gotta be stuff in the world for that to happen. There's gotta be occupants of time and space, not only for it to happen, but for it to happen in a measurable, analyzable, observable, um, uh, predictable way, i.e. for it to constitute a scientific phenomenon, right? So there's gotta be a bunch of things between my mouth and your ears Generally speaking, those things would be, in the case of sound, they'd be air molecules, right? I mean, they, but they could be water molecules or they could be the molecules of a guitar string or something like that. But let's say in the normal set of events, there are a bunch of air molecules between my mouth and your ears. Now, I move my tongue and I start shaking some of the air molecules near my mouth. What happens is, and again, for I, I know we've said this, I'm just going to say it again because it just never ceases to blow my mind. And it is what the math up there is trying to say is that I start vibrating the molecules like near my mouth. They, some air molecules begin to oscillate harmonically in their little neighborhood. Um, in, in terms of thinking about graphs and our simple model that's made out of a, a pulse along a long string, you could think of those air molecules as, vi as oscillating up and down along a Y axis. Truth told, they're not really. In the case of sound, they're actually, they are actually pushing forward and pushing back, sort of compressing near each other and expanding away from each other, making these little pressure pockets. That's a minor detail. I mean, technically, in other words, they're making what's called a compression wave rather than what's called a transverse wave. But it does not change the math at all. And it doesn't change this point at all. That we've got a little, a few air molecules that oscillate a little bit right there. And then the air molecules next to them oscillate. And then the air molecules next to them oscillate. And this keeps going, right? And then they're all oscillating harmonically according to Y equals A cosine omega T plus phi, but the phi is different for each one of them. They're all staggered in phase. So when one is at the equilibrium position, then the next set is sort of at the amplitude position and the next set is at the equilibrium, et cetera, right? So yes, yeah, so we have a bunch of these particles that are oscillating and that pattern of oscillations eventually reaches your ear. The key point, the key point first of all, Sam's point is that not one particle of air ever goes to your ear. The sound goes to your ear. And the only thing that is moving at all in order for sound to go to your ear is air, right? The things that are moving and crucially moving, like not incidentally moving, but the thing whose motion 
allows for this phenomenon to occur are air molecules. And the sound reaches your ear and the sound reaches your ear. We have, now we have to get into the details of this. The sound reaches your ear in a totally measurable, calculable, reproducible, predictable way, i.e. at what we ultimately would say is 340 meters per second, assuming air at standard temperature and pressure. And yet not one single air molecule ever goes from my mouth to your ears. First of all, that'd be disgusting if it did. Second of all, certainly no air molecule travels at 30, 340 meters per second from my mouth to your ear. So what we're, but third of all, the air that, that the sound travels through, the air that the sound travels through that does what Sam is saying, like all the little air molecules that are oscillating along in their little neighborhoods, along their little axes, right? Those air molecules aren't just in the, aren't, are not, in the way of the sound. And honestly, this is the way I used to think of it incorrectly. Like the sound moves through those air molecules. The sound pulse ripples through that vast collection of oscillating air molecules and eventually gets to your ear. And you eventually hear what I'm saying, which again, is like wild because what? Like what got to your ear? Like something super important, but nothing material, something that matters, but no matter at all. Like really, right? Um, but it doesn't, and we say that the, the sound travels through the air. We say that. That used to confuse me. I used to think that that meant that the air was kind of like in the way or something. And especially when I started hearing like, oh, sound travels at different speeds through different media, which is true. And it's where I'm heading with this discussion today. I used to hear things like, oh, the sound travels at one speed in, in air, but it travels at a different speed if it has to go through water or something like that. And it travels at one speed if the air is like hot, but it travels at a different speed if the air is like cold. All of that is true, okay? That is true. And that's what we have to discuss more today. But that confused me into thinking, when I pictured that, I was like, oh yeah, all right, I guess that sort of makes sense. Like, I mean, like the hotter the air is or like the thicker the water is, that's like sort of a big barrier for the air, to, for the sound to get through. And so I, I, I I could see how that like could slow it down, like having to get through the distance or something of the water or the hot air or something. That's what I thought. That's a misunderstanding. That's, that's a misguided picture. The air that the sound pulse is rippling through, the air is called the medium. Okay, I'm not gonna crowd this page anymore by writing that, but please remember the vast collection of oscillating material particles through which the pulse propagates, that vast collection is always from here on and called the medium, right? So, so in this case for sound is air at standard temperature and pressure. Sam is right that, that the medium constitutes that collection of actual material oscillating particles. Sam is also right that none of those particles actually propagate along the the axis that in this case we're calling X, right? Both right. But so, I mean, everything Sam is saying is right. What I thought that was wrong, just to straighten this up, is I thought the medium then was like this sort of like annoying interference that a wave had to get through. I thought the medium was like, just like, uh, no problem. Good to see you. And I was late too. Um, um, but thank you. Um, I thought the medium, totally understood. Um, I'm at work too. Um, uh, 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 but I picked a job that I enjoy. And that's my life lesson to all of you for today. Don't do what makes money. Do what you enjoy. Unless what you enjoy is making money, in which case you have a paradox on your hand. Um, the medium is not just an incidental bunch of stuff that's in the way of a wave pulse. The medium is the vast collection of things that we need in order to have a wave pulse in the first place. Maybe that's a subtle distinction, but I think it's an important one. If you ever hear someone say something like, well, you can't have a wave without a medium. I mean, that can sound confusing and weird. That can sound like someone saying, well, you can't have, uh, you know, you, you, I don't know what it sounds like, you, but it sounds like someone saying you can't make a trip without there being obstacles in your trip. And that sounds weird, like why not? Why can't we just like work hard to make a trip that doesn't have obstacles in it? But the medium is not obstacles. The medium is literally the medium of exchange. It's literally the thing, the bunch of things that are all 
moving in, in a, such an organized fashion, organized in space and in time, that the result, the resulting phenomenon, is this ripple that passes through them. If so, it's basically like saying a wave is a wiggle, a medium is the wigglers. You can't have a wiggle unless something is wiggling. The somethings that are wiggling are the individual oscillators. The magic of it, the almost mystery, but certainly like the impact of it, is that what's moving is the little oscillators. But as Sam points out, not one single oscillator will ever do the motion that we end up observing and, and measuring and calculating and enjoying. Like, again, sound is, sound is motion of air molecules. No air molecule goes where the sound goes. And put one last final way of that, I don't care how advanced your microscope is, I don't care how advanced your technology is, you're never going to find a bit of sound. There's no such thing as like a soundion or something like you, right? You can't like look closer and closer into a bunch of air molecules and eventually find the piece of air molecules that constitutes sound. There is no such piece. Sound is a phenomenon, not a thing, right? Okay, and I'm possibly over, I possibly get overexcited about that point, but it is, but it is why wave motion is so exciting to me. Wave motion is real motion that is immaterial, immaterial. Okay, it exists, but it, but not as an identifiable, discrete, or countable thing. Now, the speed, here's another exciting feature though, like the speed, or the thing that I really need to probe today, the speed at which any wave pulse propagates is that V term right here, the constant of proportionality, the square root of V squared that you're looking at on the, you know, in the blue, that V is the propagation speed along the x-axis, the immaterial speed, okay? That's what that is. Now, where did it come from? And this was on the front page where, I mean, so first of all, it's exciting that it is the constant of proportionality in the wave equation. Like that already, like that didn't have to be the case. The wave equation was already saying something, even if the constant and it just were some random number. But the fact that all this information is packed into the wave equation is, is pretty cool. But more specifically that, wave speed that we derived uh, Tuesday, let me remind you, that, wa that wave speed we got by saying, by, um, by seeing what happens when we divide angular frequency by angular wave number, right? That, that wave speed was um, two pi over period divided by two pi over wavelength. Um, put, well, why is that important? That's important. And this is the last thing we said on Tuesday, because remember, Remember, omega is the angular frequency of each oscillator. If you think of each oscillator as a mass on a spring, sorry. if you think of each oscillator as a mass on a spring, I, hold on one second, sorry, I, I think it's upstairs. Oh, oh, I thought you get all that. Okay. Um, if you think of each oscillator as a mass on a spring, the rate at which it oscillated back and forth it, radians per second. Omega was the square root of K over M. Remember, we're talking about harmonic oscillators where the rate of oscillation does not depend 
on the amplitude of oscillation. Big, big point, right? If I'm not careful, I can get myself all excited about that all over again. Like harmonic oscillators are true clocks. They tick tock at a rate in time, which is totally independent of their arrangement in space, right? Now, why is that important here? If each of those oscillators, if for example, if each of the oscillators is literally a mass on a literal spring, then it oscillates at a rate of square root of K over M. If it's like an air molecule, then this is all an analogy. Then, I mean, in other words, it wouldn't, it would be the effective K of the air molecule, which might mean it's temperature or something like that. Um, and maybe it's atomic mass or something like that. Um, but whatever it is, the rate at which each oscillator oscillates is fully determined by measurable physical properties of that oscillator, such as stiffness, mass, temperature, pressure, whatever. That is also uh, a same point can be made of K, the angular wave number. If the rate of oscillation for each of these oscillators is fully determined by the material property of the oscillator, and if the medium is just our word for the vast collection of all the oscillators, then what this ultimately is saying, and this was the last thing I said on Tuesday, this ultimately means that the rate at which a pulse propagates through a medium is fully fixed by the properties of that medium. Now that is a huge point, let me write it down. I mean, but really I'll say it again, let me write it down. What we're, well, what I said was the, the rate at which a pulse propagates through a medium is fully fixed by the material properties of that medium. What that, and I will write that down, but what that means in English or what I'm really saying in English really is a lot. I'm saying that once you know what medium you're dealing with, once you know something about your medium, once you put your medium down and maybe quantitatively measure its properties, or maybe you just sort of visually intuitively know, in other words, once you, for example, say, I got a bathtub full of water here, and I'm going to start just like tapping the surface of the water with my finger and making ripples go across the surface of the water, right? Or like a fish tank or something. Or, or you say, my medium is the, the Atlantic Ocean at Coney Island, and I'm watching ripples come in across the surface of the water at of the beach at Coney Island, right? Or you say, no, I'm talking about air through which sound is pulsing from my mouth to you, from my mouth to your ears, right? Whatever it is, once you picture a specific medium and you picture it as somewhat static and, and fixed, then, then immediately, necessarily, all wave ripples will move through that medium at a fixed, constant, and predetermined, locked in speed. That, that like the only way to change the speed of a wave is to change the nature of the medium. That, that's a really big point. Let me be a little, well, I'll write it down first. Well, no, I won't. I mean, I'm literally saying, now, there's more than one ways to change the properties of a medium. Like, for example, if we're talking about water, it's true. If you add salt to it, now it's salty water. Presumably, if you wait long enough, the salt is going to distribute throughout all the water. So now all the water is salt. So still, but, you know, or you could change the depth of water. So it's true. You could put a bunch of water in a bath that has a bottom that's tilted down like this, much like the ocean floor. And in that case, then the water would be getting like deeper and deeper as it goes. So it is true that one end of the tub would sort of it ultimately allow for speeds of, I mean, waves of a different speed from the other end of the tub. So, I mean, you can play games with this, but what I'm saying is as long as you fix the properties of the medium, then you have fixed the speed of the wave. Um, so let me write that down. And then, but that is a lot of implications. I mean, a lot of implications. Okay, before I write it down, the first two implications are, it, it means, well, no, I'm not gonna, let me write it down. Okay.
I'm saying waves travel at constant speed. A wave pulse travels at a constant speed. It doesn't accelerate or decelerate. It travels at a reliable constant speed. The speed will be as constant as the properties of the medium are. It's pretty easy to make or encounter a medium with pretty basic constant properties. I mean, like, again, like the air in a room. All right, the air in a room, it might not be literally standard temperature pressure, it might be a couple of degrees below standard temperature pressure or something like that, but whatever it is, it's warm temperature. The air in a room, I mean, that's like our whole goal of air conditioning systems and everything. When you walk into a classroom at John Jay or you walk into a room in your house, unless you just adjusted the heat or you just, you know, adjusted the air conditioner or whatever, the air has been sitting there for a while. It's evenly distributed itself throughout the room. Whatever is going on with the air in one corner of the room pretty much is going on in another corner. Of the room. That's like the point of a room, really. So, you, and that means it's a medium whose properties are fixed throughout. That means if you send a ripple through that medium, if you shout, you, the waves are going to go at a speed. They don't speed up, they don't slow down, and the speed is known in advance, that's pretty awesome. Like, first of all, that just means we have automatic cruise control on like any pulse we ever send. Like, I mean, um, all physics equations would continue to apply, all physics predictions, all physics analysis that we've ever learned in physics 203 or 204 would apply. But think about how nice and straightforward and simple physics is if you don't have to deal with acceleration. It like eliminates like 85 chapters from the last course. Like it's a big, nice convenience. and. And this is how reliable it is. You want to know, well, is it like, is this one of those physics things that's like sort of true, but like not in the real world? Oh no, this is like really, really, really true in the real world. It's so true that we all rely on this fact <clears throat> all the time and take it for granted. Example, picture any wave pulses you've ever seen in the real world of your life ever. Like picture yourself standing at the beach, watching wave pulses come into the water, or picture those wave pulses that you sent to your partner on a string where it was a simulated COVID string, whatever, COVID string, ew. Um, but like picture those ripples that you sent back and forth on the string, or picture ripples in a bathtub if you just like shake your finger or something. Picture any ripples at all, okay, right now, like realistic ripples that you made without any deliberation or like like you didn't go to school for learning how to make wave ripples. Like you just, and you didn't have a calculator when you did it, you just did it, right? But now picture those ripples and, and go, on, go with me on a memory journey. Let's all nostalgically remember the last time we were looking at ripples and remember the last time you saw one ripple sort of start creeping up and catching up to a ripple in front of it. Remember the last time you saw a ripple like, like two ripples going in the same direction and one in behind sort of get faster and faster and faster and catch up and overtake the one in front of it and then pass it and get in front. Remember that time? Right, neither do I. That totally didn't happen, right? You've never ever seen, you might have seen two waves going in opposite direction and crossing. That's cool, that's interesting, that's called interference. We can do that. We can send two waves in the opposite direction and they'll cross each other and do all kinds of cool things. But I'm not saying that, I'm saying two waves ripples that are going in the same direction. Have you ever seen one pass the other? No, you haven't, right? Neither have I. I've never seen a wave ripple pass another, ever, ever. Why? Because it can't. Because one ripple is not ever going faster than another ripple in the same medium. If I'm looking in a medium and I see two ripples, they are necessarily going the same speed. In fact, you know that concept wavelength, like the length, the distance between two waves? How is it that we even have that concept at all? What do we mean the length between two waves? We have that concept because whatever that amount is, it seems to stay steady even as the ripples glide across the surface of the water or whatever it is. They stay together like a centimeter apart or two centimeters apart or whatever. One doesn't start closing the gap and catching up to the other because they're all going the same speed always. It's like so obvious that whenever we draw waves, we always draw them that way. Everybody like knows this about waves, but but I personally had never thought about it that way until I thought about it that way, right? Waves are partly cool and make all these cool patterns and do all these things for us because they always freaking go the same speed. And whatever that speed is, we can know before they even start moving as long as we know what the medium is. That's wild, okay? I have to get into the more mathematical implications of that, but I do want to appreciate that for a moment. Last thing I want to say, you might say, no, wait a minute. Like when I stood with my partner and we sent ripples back and forth on the long string or in the simulated COVID string, da 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 da, da 
Like you might say, wait, no, hold on. I had control over that. Like sometimes I shook my hand fast and sometimes I shook my hand slow and it definitely made different types of waves when I did that. Like, wait, it wasn't up to the medium. It was up to me, one might think. But now let's be very careful. It wasn't. What you were controlling was frequency. And then what, how the wave responded was in wavelength. You weren't controlling speed. This is what I mean. First of all, one thing I want to, like this equation, V equals omega over K, right? That's the way we sort of say it in this class. It, speed of wave is angular frequency over angular wave, remember? But that's perfectly equivalent. Remember how we derived it? We, well, it's perfectly, uh, I want to write two other ways of writing it that are equivalent because one of them is much more common in books uh, than the way we say it. So remember, that was equivalent to, um, that was equivalent to wavelength lambda over t, the period, which is equivalent to lambda, the wavelength times the standard frequency. Um, so just know, there's three different ways you could write speed of wave. You could write omega over k, that's the way you tend to care about it in this class. You could write lambda over t, that's sort of how we derived it. Or you could write lambda times f. And frankly, I want you to make a note of that because that's the way you'll see it in most other classes, in many other classes, like instrumental or PCAM or something like that. That's the way you'll see it in books a lot or in any further science applications of this class. Speed of a wave is wavelength times frequency. The speed of a wave, and hopefully you can see that's totally equivalent to what we're saying, angular frequency over angular wave number, but speed of a wave is wavelength times frequency. And we're, and like, cause, and think about it, wavelength is measured in meters, frequency is measured in cycles per second. So speed of the wave is meters per second, right? What we're saying here today is that that speed term is constant always for any wave in any medium and it's constant relative to the medium uh, so what you control what you can control if you're the one sending out the wave pulses if you're generating the wave pulses you, for example ripples on a string you can shake the string more rapidly absolutely you can do that you could shake your industry more rapidly and if you do that what you're doing is generating higher frequency waves, right? You're making ripples come out that many more times per second, that you're creating waves much more frequently in time. Now, each one of those ripples you send, the minute you send it from your hand has no choice but to propagate through the string at a given fixed speed, like that's my theme of today, it will come out of your hand and start going to your lab partner along the string at one and only one speed. What you could do is send another one right after it, like in a really short amount of time. You could do that by shaking really rapidly. So you can make a really high frequency of wave, wave ripples. But if you look at this equation and you think about the logic, what makes sense is if you do that, if you make really high frequency waves, then the wave ripples are going to be really close to one another. If you're making them really frequently, then you're waiting very small amounts of time and therefore a very small amount of space will uh, elapse between any two successive ripples. So if you make frequency high, that you can do, then necessarily wavelength will be low and vice versa. In fact, again, this is what comes up in books in a lot of other courses and stuff. It becomes sort of a truism or a thing that we rely on that, that once you're talking about a certain wave, like again, it'll come up in instrumental if you're talking about, say, light waves, which are psychedelic in their own right. But if you're talking about like light waves, it becomes sort of just a thing that people take for granted that like the higher the frequency of the light wave, the lower the wavelength. And, and, and that's right. That's totally right. But that is because of the assumption that the speed on the left-hand side of this equation must be locked as a constant. So therefore wavelength and frequency become inversely proportional to each other. You can control frequency and thereby wavelength. You cannot control speed. Only the medium can control the speed. Okay, so that's a big part of what I'm saying. I keep saying that has implications. I think it does. Um, one of the implications, so I'm going to turn the page and we're going to start looking at one of the big implications. We are going to start looking at the implications. The reason there are implications, number one is the implication of reliability. Like, I think it's exciting that the minute you send a wave out, like it just starts doing its thing. 
and you can rely on it not to lose any speed or not to spontaneously gain speed. Like that's nice. We like constants in physics, but there's more to it than that. When I say the speed of a wave is fixed by the medium, what I mean correlatively is that the speed of the wave is occurring, being measured relative to the medium. What I mean by that is if I say, if I fix air at standard temperature and pressure and now start picturing or examining sound waves through the air, I, I can rely on the fact that sound waves will ripple through air at 340 meters per second. Like that's a little bit less than a thousand miles an hour. But what do I really mean by that? I mean that sound waves will, will uh, uh, travel at 340 meters per second relative to the air that they're traveling through. That's a big statement. Like, I want to remind you, all velocities are relations. Velocity is a relative concept. This goes back to physics 203 now, right? But velocity is a relation necessarily between two objects. Velocity is not a property of any one single object, right? Like, this is huge. This is Galileo. This is the idea that the Earth does not objectively sit still at the center of the universe, nor does the Earth objectively travel at 65,000 miles an hour through the universe. The Earth sits still relative to itself. It moves at 65,000 miles an hour past the sun. It moves at 650,000 miles an hour past the galactic center. The Earth's velocity depends on what you're comparing it to. And there's no meaning, no such thing at all to how fast is the earth moving, just period, in space. Like, how fast am I going right now in space? Like, no, not compared to the chair, not compared to planet earth, not compared to the sun, not compared to the subway that I'm on. Like, just how fast am I actually going right now? Meaningless question, right? Like, this is the big discovery of Galileo. This is the hub of physics, that all velocities are relational, not singular not they are prop they are relations not properties right so anytime anybody says uh, anybody asks the velocity of something in fact a physicist can't answer that question unless they follow up with well the velocity of it relative to what like relative now a lot of times we assume we know the relative to what a lot of times we assume we know the frame of reference that but that we're just assuming there has to be a frame of reference. Like, uh, in other words, if someone says, how fast is that car going? They might not bother to specify. They might take it for granted that we know that they mean how fast is that car going relative to the ground below its tires, like relative to the highway. But that is still what they're saying, right? Like you, that does have to be, uh, oh, sorry, come here. yeah, no, sorry, Blah. Uh, Paul, I buried Paul. No, we're going. Okay. Um, like if you say, like literally, it's not meaningful to say the car is going 60 miles an hour. Unless we just all agree in advance. Like if someone says the car is going 60 miles an hour, what they mean is compared to the ground. And yes, we know the ground is actually moving past the sun. And yes, we know the sun is moving past the galactic center. We're not getting into all that now, but we know that when you say the car is going relative to the ground, I mean, the car is going 60 miles an hour, you mean relative to the ground. And, and here's the thing too, like don't forget, that is not a throwaway remark because to all the people in the car, that is not how they're experiencing it all, right? If, if we always actually meant the ground and the highway as the obvious frame of reference, like, come on, get over yourself. Like, duh, yeah, 60 miles an hour means relative to the highway. Well, then that means anybody in the car, the minute someone in the car would say, oh, dude, can you pass me like your phone for a second? Like you in the car would be like, here's your phone. Okay, here's where I'll get ready for my 60 mile an hour pit, right? Like, no. In the car, you're like, we're like, the car is going zero relative to us. We're cool. We're chill. What our experience is, is that the ground is going that way at 60 miles per hour past us. And you could say like, no, that's just some physics thing. Like you're just being technical. No, you, exactly not. You're being real. Like really, you can have a normal life inside the car and like play cards with someone inside the car. Or let's say it's a plane going 500 miles an hour, right? Like when you're in the plane, you're like, oh, this movie sucks. Right, get me a drink. Is time, am I allowed to go to the bathroom yet or not? Like, you don't adjust your whole life around the knowledge that the plane is going 500 miles an hour. Because really, to you, it isn't. To you, 
the plane is going zero and you're going zero relative to the plane and the ground is going past you at 500 miles an hour. And we all live happily with that because we actually understand that velocity is a relation, not a property. So how does this apply to, to waves? It applies like this. Okay, how it relates, how it relates to waves, it, it, I'm going to say in English, but then, well, it, it relates, it has a huge mathematical uh, impact on waves. The mathematical impact that we're ultimately going to look at here today. Now, the mathematical impact, or one of the mathematical impacts we're going to look at here is called the Doppler effect, okay? And the way we're going to understand the Doppler effect is we're going to put together the equation the equation that I've been saying, we're going to put together. In fact, we'll write it the way other classes write it. We're going to take this statement about wave speed, V equals lambda F right now. And again, let me just back up for slow down for a second. V equals lambda F is like, is like just saying speed equals distance over time, but for a wave pulse, right? It's like our basic statement of, of velocity for a wave pulse. And again, remember that's about as hard as, that's about as deep as motion analysis needs to get for a wave pulse because there's no acceleration for a typical wave pulse. So we have V equals lambda F means we're talking about a wave. But now saying we're going to take that concept of wave motion and we're going to apply it back to our original understanding of motion in general, our original understanding that motion is, that, that, that velocities are all relative. We're going to put those two concepts together and see what happens. Uh, the latter concept that all velocities are relative can be expressed a number of different ways. If you took physics 203 with me, you know, like this all originally comes from Galileo's principle of relativity. There are many different ways to say and use Galileo's principle of relativity. In physics 203, in principle, we do seven forms of it, each one sort of that much more mathematically sophisticated than the one before it. No, the one that we... And again, if you took that class with me or you remember this, that's great. That'll be helpful. If you didn't, it's fine as well. Um, I'm telling you right now that one of the ways we say Galileo's principle of relativity, one of the mathematical ways we say it, we used to call form number four. I've written it down at the bottom of the page here. I'm going to say it to, like, again, I'm just trying to jog your memory. If, if this has any nostalgic value for you, that's terrific. But for anybody in the room who never saw this before or doesn't remember, I'm about to explain it right now. I'm not going to assume. I do assume you understand that the earth moves. I'm going to assume that, or no, I take that back. I'm not going to assume you understand that the earth moves because I don't understand that the earth moves. I'm going to assume that you recognize that there's like sort of this weirdness where we can simultaneously believe that the earth moves at 65,000 miles an hour past the sun. And yet we can conduct our lives as though we don't give a crap at all, right? That is Val that is Galileo, pardon my language. I don't mean to say give, I'm a taker. Um, that is Galileo's principle of relativity right there. A mathematical way of saying it is written here at the bottom of the page. I'm going to expand that or unpack that in a second. But what, the, but what I want to give you is the English behind this whole thing. The Doppler effect, the phenomenon we're about to investigate, is one of many effects that occur with waves once we recognize this simple thing, that the speed of a wave is fixed and constant relative to its medium, right? All velocities are relations. So when we say that sound moves at 340 meters per second through air, 
Again, we're not just using air as like some annoying obstacle that the sound has to get through. The air is the box through which the, uh, the sound is transmitted. It is transmitted at 340 meters per second compared to or relative to or from the perspective of or from the frame of reference of that air, okay? So, I mean, that's like the truth so far, like a wave travels at a speed that is relative to its medium. It's in fact determined by its medium. But then what that means, since all velocities are relative, what that means is that if you were to move the air, right, if you were to adjust the speed of the air relative to you, whoever you are, then you would be adjusting the speed of the wave or better yet, more realistically, Sound moves at 340 meters per second relative to air, no matter what we say or do about it. But if we also are moving relative to the air, then relative to us, sound is not going to move at 340 meters per second anymore. You see what I'm saying? Like, just in English, the broad stroke of this is all wave pulses have a speed that is reliable and constant and noble and beautiful and fixed by and measured relative to their media. But the minute we experience or observe any motion whatsoever relative to their media, now we have different motion observed by the wave itself. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just let that sink for a second. Um, yeah, like, okay, so here's But GPR4, GPR4 is GPR4 number four is basically saying how to handle velocities once you have more than two objects, once you have say three objects. Like GPR, GPR, Galileo's principle of relativity is saying, look, if you only have one object, you don't have it, then the velocity is meaningless. Okay. First of all, velocity does not meaningfully apply if you're only picturing one object or if your universe only has one object. It just doesn't mean anything. It's a comparison. So what in fact, in fact, actually. In fact, let me even more, let me, let me, re, okay, I should have done this. Let me give you the more expansive version of GPR4 right now. What I mean is this, GPR4 tells you how to deal with them.
it's easiest to see in its expanded form like this. What GPR number four, number four is saying is, look, if you only have one object called object A, the velocity of it doesn't mean anything. You could say, well, what about the velocity of it relative to it? Can I say that? Yeah, you can say that. And the answer is always zero, right? What's the velocity of me relative to me? Nothing. What's the velocity of my glasses relative to my nose? Nothing. No matter how fast my nose goes, my, gla my glasses are always right on my nose, right? So the velocity of all object to itself is nothing, always. So we need at least two objects to talk about velocity in a meaningful way. But then, so let's say we have two objects, A and B, right? What this is saying is, okay, now you can talk about velocity in a meaningful way. You can talk about it in a meaningful way, but there's not a lot to say about it. Because if you just have two objects, right? Like, like me and the pen or the stylus, right? So the stylus is going past my face. If the stylus is going past my face at 100 miles an hour to the east, then my face is going past the stylus at 100 miles an hour to the west, right? Like, and that, that's the point. If you could say the earth is going past the sun at 65,000 miles an hour this way, or you could say that the sun is going past the earth at 65,000 miles an hour that way. And both reference frames are equally legitimate. The laws of physics hold at all constant velocities, right? So the second, I mean, the thing that's hard to get our mind around sometimes is that either way of saying those things is just as true as the other. Like that's sort of the whole earth sun breakthrough. But I think mathematically, very few people disagree. Like, or if you're in an airplane and you, you, you could either say I'm going past the clouds or what you visually experience is the clouds are going past me. Now, in your heart of hearts, you might think, I know what's really going on is I'm going past the clouds. That's what's actually happening. I'm here to tell you as a physicist, no, get rid of that word actually. Like, no, that's just you saying that. There's no more actual truth to you going past the clouds than the clouds going past you. But either way, what I'm sure we both, and I do want you to see that, but either way, what we're both agreeing on is the numbers would work out the same way, right? Like if, if the clouds are going negative 100 past you, then you're going positive 100 past them or vice versa. That's the second, that's if you have two objects. So then the real question becomes, well, okay, like if it's always just that symmetric, if velocities require pairs, but within the pairs, they're that symmetric, when does it get interesting? Like, when can we talk about numbers actually doing anything? And the answer is once you have three objects. Once you have three objects, now what the relativity of velocity means, demands, requires, is that velocities in fact add as vectors. Velocity, in fact, is a vector, is another way of putting this thing. So what we what we experience all the time in the, is the simple cases of this, and this is where everybody would presumably believe, is if you take a subway home, right, and you get in your seat on the subway. So name three objects. Here are the three objects. Object A is you, object B is the subway, and object C is the New York City streets, right? What everybody knows intuitively is, is the reason they take subways is you get in the subway, your velocity relative to the subway, in other words, velocity of A relative to B is zero. You sit in the subway, you fall asleep, whatever, like you're in your chair, you're not doing anything. The chair is not moving out from under you. Your velocity relative to the subway is zero. The velocity of the subway relative to the New York City streets is say 85 miles an hour, right? You eventually get home you don't break a sweat. <laughs> like you didn't move your legs. You didn't have to do anything. You fell asleep. You paid your fare. What does that mean? It means that you believed in your heart that the A to B, the velocity of you relative to the subway zero, plus the velocity of the subway relative to New York City streets 185, zero, you believe zero plus 85 makes 85, i.e. the velocity of you relative to the streets. Like you believe the subway worked. You believe that the velocity of the subway relative to the streets added to the velocity of you relative to the subway to give you a total resulting velocity of you relative to the streets, right? And I'm not talking about motors and engines here. I'm just talking about the way velocity works, right? That you could have zero relative to it. It could have 85 relative to blah. And therefore you have 85 relative to blah. Now you believe this even more further, even when the numbers are not that simple, right? Like when you get on an escalator, at Columbus Circle, I don't even know if that or it still exists, but it, sorry, pardon me. Yeah, you, whoa, okay. You get on an escalator and you're in New Yorker, right? So for a moment, you're standing on the escalator because you're tired and you've had a rough day and you've had all these science labs and blah, 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 and you've been wearing a mask and can't breathe and all of this. Um, 
But then there's someone from not New York standing right in front of you on the right hand side of the escalator. Or maybe actually, if they're not from New York, they don't even know to do that. And they're standing in front of you on the left. And then you like, you want to like be upset about that, but then you don't get upset because you're not even there right now. And this is a hypothetical, right? But what do you do then? What you do is because you, you want to get home, you start walking up the up escalator on the left hand side, right? believing that now velocities will add even when non-zero numbers are involved, right? You believe that if the escalator, and you're right, that if the escalator is going 10 miles an hour relative to the mall, and you're going five miles an hour relative to the escalator, that you'll go 15 miles an hour relative to the wall, mall. And you even know that even if, right? You know that that's true. And you even know if you're like, a, say, a 12-year-old boy, maybe, or a seven-year-old boy or something, not a 17-year-old boy, but if you're like a little kid, what's fun to do is play with negative signs, right? You actually know that you can start running up the down escalator and you can run up the down escalator in such a weird, like in a deliberate enough fashion to actually match the speed of the down escalator and then be like running really hard, but have someone over in the mall look at you and you look like road runner with like the legs going crazy underneath and your head going nowhere, if you know what I'm saying, right? Because you know intuitively and you believe that velocities add even when negative signs are involved and so that if you're going 10 miles an hour to the set down relative to the escalator and the escalator is going 10 miles an hour up relative to the mall, you'll go zero relative to the mall, right? Velocities, and that's all the TPR form number four is saying. It's, it's, that, it's just saying velocities add like that. When you want to add velocities, you add velocities from two different frames of reference, right? What it's really also correlatively saying is like, you don't, if I throw a baseball through a room and someone else throws a tennis racket through a room, no one ever asks like, what's the speed of the tennis racket plus the baseball? Like that's like not, like in other words, they don't ask what's the speed of the baseball relative to the room plus the speed of the tennis racket relative to the room. Like that's not a meaningful question. They could ask it, you could do the numbers out on a piece of paper, but it wouldn't have anything to do with the physical world. When we add velocity, right? Because you don't add velocities of two different objects in the same frame of reference. When we add velocities, we take an object in a frame of reference, we add that to the velocity of that frame of reference relative to some other frame of reference. And what we get, like transitivity, is the velocity of the first object relative to the third. Okay, that's what this is saying. I claim that you do it all the time and believe it all the time, even when you're not thinking of the math. The one big leap of this is it's saying, no matter how complicated the example is, even if negative signs are involved, even if two or three or higher dimensions are involved, like this even works on angles and with vector components and all that. We don't have to get into that right now, but I'm just saying that it is saying velocities really add like that for all time in all circumstances. That's what it's saying. Now I'm saying, and I know we're running out, we have nine minutes left. I'm saying we got to apply that every time. We got to apply this to velocity equals lambda f every time we consider wave motion because the relativity of motion is built right into waves in that right away when we say there's when we talk about their velocity we are necessarily talking about about it excuse me um relative to a very specific reference frame that being their medium so Okay, so we've got eight minutes, so I'm going to start on an example. Tell me if you want me to flip back the page.
Okay. So I know we only have five minutes. So largely what I'm doing right here is setting us up. I'm, I'm not going to pretend to do, we're not going to do this whole thing right now. I'm setting this up. You, you might even want to tell me in the chat. You, I think you're right about to do this in lab if you didn't already start. I think you're going to have a board meeting discussion about this in lab. So, and I don't want to give that the answers away anyway, but I want to set you. So maybe, and I know we have four minutes now. You can put in the chat. If, have you seen this yet in lab? Um, yes or no. Maybe you could put in the chat. Um, but no, okay, great, great. Then for everybody, they're good. So that's, and thank you, Sam. So the good news is I'm about to just like give you a leg up for the lab that's about to, you're about to, to examine this in lab. I'm not gonna give away the answers, but it, this might help set you up and not be thrown. The Doppler effect is, literally the Doppler effect is, eh, right? Like, I mean, you're all familiar with the experience of the Doppler effect, I think. A classic example of the Doppler effect is like when a motorcycle or some kind of vehicle or an ambulance or something is going past you, is like going down the street in New York City and, and you hear that funny change in sound as, as the vehicle passes your ear. Um, and it often does sound something like, eh, um, it doesn't sound anything like that, but you know what I mean. Um, what's going on with the Doppler effect? The, the Doppler effect is a very real thing, and that's just one instance of it. But uh, the Doppler effect is something that occurs with any wave at all. The, a very, very common application of it is with sound waves. Okay, The Doppler effect occurs when we have a source of a wave and we have a receiver of a wave, and when the source and the receiver are not in the same frame of reference when there is motion of any kind of either the source or the receiver relative to the medium. Like when, when in other words, the Doppler effect occurs if, if you have a source and a receiver that are, not, that are not both fixed in the medium. So if I'm just sitting here in air and I shout at you and you're just sitting here in air, there's no Doppler effect. That would be like a standard wave transmission circumstance. But if I shout at you while I'm running through air, or, and or, you are listening while you're running through the air, then there's going to be a Doppler effect. And if both are happening at different speeds, then there's going to be a Doppler effect. If any, if either the source or the receiver has motion relative to the medium, if either the source or the receiver is not in the same reference frame as the medium, then we get a Doppler effect. And what is the effect that I mean, or what is a Doppler effect? It is this, it is that if either the source or the receiver are not in the same frame of reference as the medium, then the frequency of the wave will be measured by the source as one value and will be measured by the receiver as a different value. Put more simply, the source and the receiver will disagree on frequency of that wave. And when I say disagree, I don't just mean like one of them's an idiot and the other one's smart. I mean, their measuring equipment will get two different numbers. I mean, their experience will be two different frequencies. I mean, for example, and I know there's one minute, if we're talking about sound, then they will hear two different pitches. Like frequency for sound is pitch, like according to your ear and brain. And neither one, and just like all relativistic phenomenon, neither one of the, the source from the receiver will be any more right or wrong than the other. When, so very quickly with one minute, I'm just gonna give you the concept, um, uh, but I'll tell you any Doppler effect. So the classic Doppler effect problem is a source sends a wave to a receiver. There's motion of either the receiver or the source. You're given, in a classic Doppler effect problem, as you will be in the lab, you're given the speed of the wave relative to the medium, because that's always given, that's always known. You're given the speed of the source relative to the medium, and you're given the speed of the receiver relative to the medium. One of them will often be zero. You're given the, and I know that it's 1.30, I'm just about done, and we will, but just so you see what's happening. You're given the frequency of the wave relative to the source, and you're asked to find out the different frequency as measured by the receiver. What this translates to in math is you use the two equations that I've been talking about all period. Like literally, I mean, I'm not doing it for you now, but just as a hint, you're going to use V equals lambda F, and you're going to use VAC equals VAB plus B, VBC to work this out. How does it, like, how does, it, and, you're, and I'll even give you a big hint, you're going to each use each one of those equations twice if you do this right. 
And I'll give you even a bigger hint since those of you are staying late here and I know we're done. My biggest hint of all is to figure out, to answer a Doppler effect problem as you will have to in lab, always first solve for the wavelength of the sound as measured by the source. That's my big hint. If you get the wavelength of the sound as measured by the source, this is a huge hint actually, if you're still paying attention. And then you recognize that that's the one thing that the source receiver will have to agree on. If you know the wavelength of the source, that the receiver will agree that's the wavelength. And if you use, and then if you go to the receiver and you're like, well, this is the wavelength according to the receiver, let me see how he or she experiences the frequency. You'll find that they get a different frequency if you use the other equation from the source because, and this is my last thing, and then we're going, and thank you so much for being so patient. Because just think of it intuitively. If you're standing at the, at the beach at Coney Island and waves are coming in and hitting you in the face, like with a certain frequency, if you think about it, if you started running into those, into those waves, wouldn't they hit your face with a greater frequency? Yes, they would, because they were tra they're traveling at the speed relative to the medium, always to the water. But if you start moving toward the water, then from your perspective, they're moving toward you. They will, those waves will get to you more frequency, but more frequently than if you were just standing still. The math to get the actual numbers is just those two equations that I've been saying all period. That's what you're gonna do in lab. I know I went a little bit over, Thank you so much for your patience. I'm done. I'm cutting it off. I mean, but I'm here for any questions. I'll hang out for a second. But thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Yes, thank you. You have a great weekend too. Have a great weekend. Thank you. I'm, I'm here for questions. Thank you guys. Uh,